Hello, my name is Michael Lambert. Um, a very good friend of mine has a channel which most many of you will will, will know of. Um, it's Rob Groves and he has a, a, a YouTube channel called uh, Truth to Power. Really, really good channel. He's um, very professional and uh, extremely informative. And if you if you don't know of him, uh, I, I really, really recommend him. Anyway, he, he, he contacted me recently and asked if I would be interested in doing a sort of question and answer uh, session with him. Uh, he'd got a number of questions from his, uh, his, his uh, followers and so on. And so earlier this week, we sat down and did it. And uh, today I'd like to show you what uh, the result was. And I, I, I hope you find it of interest. So uh, please enjoy and uh, until next time. Bye for now. Okay, Michael, first question then is from uh, Brian Hennessy, who asks, how did the British people fall for past and current propaganda that even Goebbels would be proud of? There are two points to make here. The first one is, and I think this is really quite important, that the majority of people couldn't care less about politics. They're not mm. really very interested in politics. That's true. I, I, I think you have to look at the newspapers and... I mean, not, many, not that many people buy newspapers anyway, but you can, only, you can see the sorts of stories that people are interested in. They're much more interested in football and, 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 and celebrities and the rest of it. Yes, and the royal family. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I don't think they're very interested in politics. The propaganda, I mean, comes from, from, from the, the mouthpieces of the, you know, the Farages and, uh, and Johnson and Trump, people who've got a lot of charisma, and they just take, take, take the narrative. People just follow them because they're so powerful in terms of their rhetoric and so on. My own father has uh, been a sort of Labour man all his life. He worked on the fat floor of a factory, but he voted for Boris Johnson because he said to me, he's a showman, he's fun. Yeah. And that's as much interest in politics as he gets. It's yeah. scary. Yeah. Oh, the other thing, Michael, is as well, of course, you know, the, the tabloid press are uh, overwhelmingly owned by offshore billionaires with exactly. a, a hidden agenda. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and they use the, the, the press in this country, uh, they use it as their mouthpiece to, to put across a, a, a world view that... Yeah. It's very different to what's in the interest, I think, of, of normal people. But... I agree. I agree absolutely. I think there is some consolation in the fact that um, Murdoch is ninety, and 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 the remaining Barclay brother is um, eighty-eight. So at least they're not going to be around much longer. And, and and maybe whoever takes over for them might be more more reasonable. But there's also some conversation in the fact yes. that, that that newspaper circulations are all going down. Yes. So fewer and fewer yes. people are getting their 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 news from the the newspapers. But uh, yes. I think I think the press in this country is pretty pretty second rate, and I, I, I mean yes. most of it. And when you look at the Daily Express, which is really, I mean I don't know how you can call it a newspaper. It's just so bad. It's mm. a, it's, a, it's a comic, and so many people get their news from the headlines in the in the in the Express. And and yet we see news aggregation sites on the internet that are taking various sources to try and give a balanced um, view of the news. Yes, um, a lot of those are, are delisting the Daily Express, the Daily Mail, things like that. They don't consider them proper newspapers. And yet exactly. still, as you say, they're the most popular newspapers, or among them, in, yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Brian doesn't specifically mention the BBC, but I mean, my own personal feeling is the BBC's reporting. Uh, they've just become a bit of a government mouthpiece over the last two or three years. It's like they've got a gun to their head. If you criticise the government too much, we're going to cut the funding or we're going to yeah. decriminalise um, licence fee cheats and things yeah. like that. So, And they've got their right wing placeman in as, uh, as Director General now, haven't they? Um, yes, they've got the clean sweep, haven't they? They've got the director yes. general, they've got the chairman, and now Sir Robbie Gibb, who was David Cameron's advisor, has now been appointed yep. to the board. Yep. So it's And yet they say that the BBC has a left-wing bias. I mean, you only have to look at who's in control, really, to see yes. that's not true. That's yes, just not true, true. true. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was a long, long time uh, um, being persuaded that the, that the BBC were actually biased, but I, I've seen lately it's, it's got worse and worse. And this insistence mm. on balance, whereby you have somebody coming on from one side who presents a reasonable argument and you get someone from the extreme uh, opposite to, to, to put an opposing argument for everything. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. It, it, it um, distorts everything. But I think, I think Newsnight still is, is one programme that I, I, I kind of trust. But um, Yes, I, I agree with that. A, yeah. Apart from that, I, 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 uh, yes, I agree. The news is terribly, um, terribly balanced yeah. uh, in order not to upset the government. 
Yeah, I, st- I stopped watching Question Time a, a couple of years ago, and uh, yes. it then came out that the uh, the assistant producer who was uh, doing the audience selection had affiliations with the English Defence League, which really? sort of explained a lot to me. Yes, because yes. yes. I just I just found it difficult to watch, not because of the panelists. I'm always willing to listen to all sides, mm. but some of the questions from the audience were just appalling. It's also quite interesting on the subject of, of, of Question Time that. Um, Farage was on there 34 times, which is more than anybody else, with the exception, I think, two two other MPs. I think Paddy Ashdown was one of the other ones. 34 times he's been on there. I mean, representing a, a, a minority party. Uh, yeah, he's never been elected to anything in his life. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Right. Despite trying time and time again. Yes. Uh, next question, Michael, is from Jason Reeves, who asks, what can be done to solve the problems rather than just blaming someone else? What event will change enough opinion in Brexiters and the nation to get over the I am right, we won attitude? The someone else are the problems. I mean, that's, that's, that's the answer to the first question. I mean, you know, they, they have caused the problems and, and, and inevitably we're going to complain about them. As far mm. as finding solutions are c- concerned, you've got to get rid of the, the problem. You've got to get rid of the... The present government, you know, if we stop grumbling, well, what's going to happen? Um, oh, in terms of what event's going to change uh, um, change public opinion, I don't think it's going to be any any single big event. I think it's going to be a whole series of events. I think, for mm. example, at the end of this month, we've got uh, the end of furlough. We've got uh, electricity and, and gas prices going up. We've got uh, the ending of the universal credit uh, uplift, £20 a week. And then, we, of course, we're going to start in, uh, uh, import controls from the end of this month. That's going to result in right. more shortages and prices going up even more. And I think yes. it's just going to be accumulation. And people are going to gradually, as the winter evenings come in, it's getting a bit cold and we've got to stay home with the heating on and so on. People are going to yes. start saying this isn't really what we wanted. And, and, yeah, you know. they're going to start uh, maybe that their their pride in Brexit is going to start slipping. I think as yeah. well. You know, yeah. this 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 the human brain finds it so difficult to admit it's wrong. Yes. Uh, it takes quite a bit to change it back. And it, as you say, Michael, it'd be a, a series of small taps rather than some you know climactic event so. i'm sure and just to add to your list called the other factor that i'm hoping will will help tip things is is these thousands of people we forget about that are still on furlough until the end of yes. this month as well yeah so they'll be coming back into the workforce and i'm imagining that if they're still on furlough at this stage their companies pretty much can do without them and they'll be made redundant right. so i think that right. unemployment rate is going to soar perhaps i think so month. i think so mm. and of course people say well there are all these um with shortages and so on uh, 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 you know, thinking that perhaps you can just uh, uh, take, a, take, take somebody who's been working in a factory and make them a lorry drive. We can't do that. And they're in no. the part of the part, part of the country as well. Uh, I mean, there just isn't, you know, because there's a, a pool of uh, un- unemployed and there are a load of jobs. It doesn't mean necessarily they're going to fit together. It'd be nice if, yes, easy that's if right. they did, but uh, yeah. that isn't, isn't going to work out that way. Yes, this I'm right, we won attitude. I mean, both you and I see it a lot in our comments on, on our YouTube channels. Is the number of people that tell me, we won, you lost, get over it, as though it's still some sort of victory. They don't seem to realise that every one of us has lost. We've lost all sorts of freedoms from the vote. I've noticed far fewer people saying, uh, you lost, get over it, uh, recently. When really? I started, I used to get a lot. Yes, a far, far, yeah. far fewer these days. Um, yeah. yeah, you get the... Uh, the usual sort of criticisms and so on, but um, that 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 simple, you lost, get over it. I, I'm seeing much, much less of that. Oh, that's um, good. I, I think good. I think people. I mean, you've got to be pretty pretty stupid not to recognise that uh, already Brexit has done so much damage to the economy, and um, to go on piping yeah. up, uh, spouting about uh, how good it is and so on is just 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 crazy. Next question, Michael. The freckle puny asks. Um, I personally think politics, economics, and law need to be mandatory subjects in school. Would you or Michael agree? I wish they were when I was at school. Far too many people are not only ignorant of how these areas of life and society operate, but also how they affect them in their everyday lives. Uh, I completely and utterly agree. I think this is absolutely right. I'm not sure about law. I don't think it's necessary to teach law in school, but I think economics and politics are, are really should be absolutely compulsory subjects. Mm. Uh, they don't have to be throughout your school career. I mean, maybe uh, the last couple of terms when you're at school, but I think everyone should understand what an MP is and how he's elected and why he's elected and how the government works. Only generally, you don't have to know a lot of detail, but just to understand it, because 
I believe most people got, haven't got a clue. Yeah, I had a Belgian girlfriend for, for many years in my 20s and uh, I know for a fact she, she was a little bit younger than me and, and she told me that she couldn't believe that we weren't taught uh, what she called civics in, in England. It's, it's widely taught yeah. across the continent. I have French and German friends that all uh, have told me that they're taught that in school, how the political system works, the responsibility that the electorate has to vote and everything. It's all very much encouraged yeah. in schools and they're taught about how it works. And we, we have nothing similar in, in the UK as far no. as I'm aware. So so yeah. I think that would be, it comes back to your point earlier about people just aren't interested in politics. And I think to a certain exactly. extent, a lot of people don't understand politics. I, I, I don't think it matters that people are not interested in politics, as long as you don't ask them in a referendum whether you should leave Europe or not. But mm. I think uh, um, just, just to have a basic understanding, just to know why you vote or why you should vote and, mm. and just how government works, I, it seems yes. to me yeah. absolutely yeah. essential that. Uh, Peter Barlow asks, how long will the government's we did what the people wanted defence hold up? One thing you can be sure of, the government are going to blame, going to blame everyone but the government. It's yes. Going to be, uh, it's going to be Covid or it's going to be uh, the EU. It's going to be EU to blame first. And when that, that doesn't really work, when Covid has, has, has faded away, when it's no longer a problem and when uh, it's pretty obvious that the EU are not, not being... Uh, uh, deliberately uh, vindictive and, and making life difficult for us, then they're going to blame the people. They're bound to say uh, it's, it's the will of the British people, it's what the people wanted. Yeah. I think they've already started this, actually. I think, I think so, too. Oh, it's, some statement. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly Did you see what the same saying. statement last week? They said something about uh, the British people re voted repeatedly um, for, for to ending uh, freedom of movement. Yes. Yeah, so they, fact, they're all... Yeah. Yes, I did a, a double take section, I think, in my, <laughs> my last video with, when I, I, I actually covered that, I think. And it's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, we voted repeatedly to end freedom yeah. of movement. I don't, I don't yeah. remember that, do you? I, I don't remember. No, I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't definitely but, not. <laughs> but, yeah, the language coming out of the Home Office, I mean, that was, uh, that was you know, putatively from a Home Office spokesman. Uh, that it's, yes. it's almost like this isn't the government this is the civil service saying this but it's so politically yeah. loaded some of the statements coming yes. out yes um well you've only got to look at the home secretary haven't you to... well it explains it all doesn't it okay. next question michael uh chas hazel this clearly isn't sustainable for the uk i'm assuming brexit as the deal is signed what realistic options are there to resolve the current shortages they're not temporary they they, they, they are permanent shortages and when you uh send away a chunk of your workforce, a significant chunk, mostly people doing jobs that we don't want to do, and then you make it impossible for them to come back, you're going to create shortages, and uh, shortages because there aren't people to distribute the goods that, that, that we need, uh, or to dig the fields and whatever, uh, um, and so on. And uh, I, I don't see how this is going to be solved. I mean, as far as the lorry drivers are concerned, they're clearly going to get a big, a big increase in pay. They're probably going to all be on forty, fifty thousand by you know, in a few months, and and that will that will attract a lot of other people to go into to to, to, to driving lorries. Um, but you can't just train up a load of people. I mean, quasi quoting. Uh, I was talking about training up a hundred thousand people. That ain't going to happen quickly. That's going to take a long time. And until that's sorted out, there are going to be shortages in the shops, and these shortages will get worse especially when we start introducing import controls at the end of the month. So I think the shortages is, is, is a problem we're going to have to live with for a long time. And I think that's one of the problems that people are going to get cross about. Yes. You know, when you can't get a blood test, your routine blood test, because there aren't any glass vials, I mean, that's pretty, pretty serious shortage. This refers back to a, a previous uh, question where, 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 where we were asked, you know, what's going to change the public perception of Brexit and whether it was a good or bad idea. Yeah. It's these death of a thousand cuts, you know, as you say, not yes. being able to get a blood test, uh, you know, months and months of shortages. I mean, how long will it take to train up these new HGV drivers? And the 100,000 figure you mentioned there, yeah. Michael, you know, I've heard that it seems to be accepted by the government now that there is about 100,000 yes. shortfall. Um, but it's not just yeah. lorry drivers. There's also shortages, as you say, in other areas and, and warehouse staff particularly which is why yeah. this, it's the yeah. supply chain that just seems to be so impacted at the moment um they're talking about yeah. you know uh, allowing visas for for europeans but the government seems to be very reluctant to to go down that route by basically putting the blame back on british employers 
uh, yes. saying it's their fault for not training up enough people. The, the yeah. onus is on them to start training these people. I have no idea well, how long it takes to train an HGV driver, have you? I imagine it's a year quite or Quite a so. while, and it's quite, ex- it's quite expensive, and uh, quite a while, yes. And if, you, if you're going to rush it, you can have people on the roads that are driving 40 tonne lorries at 70 miles an hour. And also, you know, layered on top of that, it's not just the shortage of lorry drivers, the shortage of warehouse operatives, but also we've got the bureaucracy, the, the non-tariff barriers, as they call them, at the ports. Marks and yes. Spencer said this week that they need 700 different documents for one lorry. And that was in the I Mail on that. Sunday. I mean, <laughs> yep. it's uh, yes. absolutely crazy. 700 documents for but a lorry. But bear in mind that all this... Sorry, sorry. Uh, but all this extra paperwork is, is going to apply the other way uh, uh, from the 1st of October. Right. And a, a lot of uh, European exporters are just going to say, sod this, we're not going to bother to export no. to, to, to the UK if there's all this trouble. Yeah. So that's going to add to shortages as well. Yeah. And I think another thing, going back to the thing about uh, um, training people up to do things, because the idea is we send away all these, these Europeans and then we train our own new people up. Yeah. Yeah, we're a reasonably prosperous society and we've employed, as, as all societies do as they get richer, you employ people from poorer countries to come and do the work you don't want to of do. Of course, all over the world and, that happens, and, and, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And people in this country leaving schools, they don't want to go and dig fields in Lincolnshire in the pouring rain at four o'clock in the no. morning on a, on, a, on a winter morning. No. They don't want to do it. Yeah. They don't want to do all these dirty jobs. They don't want to work in, in, in changing old ladies' diapers in a, in, a, in a care home. Yeah. They don't want to do that. That's why, that's, that's why we've been using all these people who've been prepared to do it because of the earning extra money from more yeah. money than they would uh, earn at home uh, have come here to do these jobs and we've 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 we're very happy to have them here yes but now suddenly they've all been sent away and they're not allowed to come back i mean there's no way they're coming back no no and i think this 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 as i said just now i think this whole idea of giving away visas and they're all going to be queuing up to come here they're not this is not the promised no. land they're not going to come back no why would they? They're in Germany or France and Italy. They're not sitting around, yeah. sitting at home thinking, oh, I wish I could go to the UK to work. Yeah. Next question, Michael, is from Hocko90, who asks, when will Starmer begin to attack the government's handling of Brexit and begin to fight for those who've been disadvantaged by it? I've spoken to you in the past, Michael, and you know uh, pretty much in my life I've been a, a Labour man, not, not tribally. Uh, I've voted yep. for um, all the parties apart from the Conservatives at some point or another. Um, I... I must say, I, I was actually a member of the Labour Party during the last leadership poll, and I voted for Lisa Nandy, which I can't believe now, seeing how she's performed post-Brexit. She's swung round and she's supported yep. the government on, on Brexit, so I've been very disappointed in her. I think the reason she's pro-Brexit is because her constituents who were very pro-Brexit, mm. and she was concerned about her her own vote if she uh, came out against Right. I may be wrong, but I think that's... Oh, that could well be the case. Sorry. No, 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 not at all. Um, Keir Starmer, I wasn't that upset when, when he won. I thought, you know, give the guy a chance. Uh, he's, he's clearly uh, sort of almost a, a centrist, a sort of um, Tony Blairite type character in terms of where he sits on the political spectrum. But I, I found him very ineffective, Michael. I think it's something as superficial and shallow, I have to say, as, as just the timbre, timbre of his voice. I, you know... I, he doesn't have authority, despite the Sir label. He comes across as a, a fairly weak and unemotional sort of character. What's your view of him? I, I, I like you. have been very disappointed. I, I was very happy when he became leader because I think he's a thoroughly nice man. He's a decent man. He's obviously very clever, very competent. I think if he were prime minister, I mean, he'd be a very good prime minister. Um, we wouldn't have all the fireworks we're getting at the moment. But we're living in this age, going back to the, the thing about the, the, the media and so on, get this age where everything is about 30 second clips on the news and, uh, and about making a splash. And the reason people like uh, uh, um, uh, Johnson and, uh, and uh, Trump and uh, Farage do so well is that they're such good performers on the television. They've got this, this spark, this flair, this charisma. And no matter how much you dislike them, I mean, these guys really attract a crowd. And I'm afraid Starmer's the absolute opposite. Yes. I mean, nobody's going to rush to watch the television <laughs> if he comes on the news. And uh, and I don't think that's something he can do much about. I, I would go for Johnson personally. Uh, I think I'd uh, I'd mock him a lot more. I, I'd ridicule him. I, I mean, you can say, you know, for example, you could say, if he can't comb his hair, how can he run the country? You know, that sort of thing. Just personal insults that will that will actually get a bit of 
people will pick up on these things and gradually if you repeat these things over and over again people start thinking you know he is a bit of a clown well not only that but um, i've seen a couple of uh, prime minister's question times where keir starmer's got under johnson's skin um he has got a real yeah. temper and, and you know people that have worked with him and dominic cummings said this the guy has got yes. a real temper and i don't think the electorate yeah. think, you know they think he's a bumbling clown but they've not seen that nasty yes. side to him this nasty horrible temper that he has um, yep. you know, let, let's not forget this is the guy that, that tried to pay someone to beat up a journalist who was critical of him. Uh, yes. He's a nasty piece of work. And I think you're absolutely right. If yep. Keir Starmer could actually go almost, you know, they say don't make ad hominem attacks. I've been told off for that many times on, on my channel. But, yep. you know, th I think that's a great strategy, Michael, just, just to show Boris Johnson yep. for, for the true person he is, not the character he plays. Boris Johnson was having an affair with Carrie Simmons while his wife at the time was being treated for cancer. That's the sort mm. of man he is. Yeah. He's just not a nice guy. I mean, lots of Christians vote for Boris Johnson. And to me, he's the antithesis of a Christian, much like Trump in America. You know, all the evangelicals were voting for Trump purely because he was anti-abortion. But could you imagine a less Christian person than Donald Trump? And I don't think yeah. Boris Johnson's that far yeah. behind. He is, is the antithesis of, of Christianity. Going back to Keir Starmer, I, I mean, he's never ever going to have a better opportunity to knock a government. I mean, this government couldn't be doing worse and on, on major issues as well and yet he's staying so silent and every now and then he'll just pop up and make a polite criticism but it maybe he's got some long-term strategy and maybe he's waiting well for that's to right. collapse and then just 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 put the knife in but i i don't know um, is he playing the like long it. game yeah yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe. no it doesn't look like it no mm. i mean certainly on brexit i mean uh, yeah, let's the fifty-two forty-eight thing. It's basically half and half, and another yep. third of the population didn't bother to vote. Keir Starmer sh should. I mean, here we are, Michael. It's been five years after the referendum. I know that the the current guys of the Conservative Party are very pro Brexit, of course, and they're very pro a, a hard mm. Brexit. The Lib Dems have always been very strongly against it for remaining yep. or rejoining now. But I still don't know where Keir Starmer's Labour Party sits. No. They're completely on the fence. Yeah. Um, there was, you know, they were pressurised so much to push for this people's vote, this uh, this sort of uh, vote on the actual Brexit deal we ended up with. Because let's not forget the advisory referendum yes. was just a straight yes or no answer. We, uh, yeah. Brexiters say we knew what we were voting for, but they clearly didn't. Yes. There, were, there were all sorts of arguments about the deal. Uh, yeah. Why hasn't Keir Starmer called for a vote on the actual deal? That's, that's where yeah. I'm most disappointed in him. He's, he's yes. given the government a free pass. Very disappointing so far. Maybe, maybe he'll surprise us all. Who knows? Next question's from Luke SW. If Johnson is somehow removed as leader of the Conservative Party, who do you think is most likely to replace him? What do you think? If it were me choosing, I would choose Jeremy Hunt without any doubt whatsoever, but um, I won't have a say, and neither will anyone else in the country except for members of the um, Conservative Party and uh, paid-up members of the Conservative Party, and we know what they are. They're all old folks, and they're all pro-Brexit, and they're all hardliners, and so we'll end up with someone. We'll end up, I don't know, uh, um, probably Rishi Sunak, I would imagine, but, um, I, 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 you know, the fact that the, the Tory party uh, elects the Prime Minister seems, seems, seems pretty wrong to me. And I think it's a great pity we don't all have a say in it. My guy would be Jeremy Hunt. I think he's the most reasonable. And if you take the cabinet, I mean, 62% of the cabinet were, were, were um, uh, pro-Remain. So, I mean, you can't really have somebody who's a Prime Minister who voted for Remain and uh, is pushing ahead with Brexit. So I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, um, I think Brexit is still the biggest issue at the moment in terms of, you know, who's yes. going to head the Tory party. It's still not done. You know, get Brexit done. Here we are. It's still not done. You know, as we say, not at least really. until next month when the, uh, the, the full regulations well, come into play. It isn't really going to be done for years, is it? It's just going to go on and on no. and on. Oh, it's, it's just going on and on. Yeah. yeah. It'll be the gift that keeps taking, as I, exactly. as I like to say. Um, yeah, I, did, I don't want to push uh, my channel, but I did a video on this very subject actually a few weeks ago um, where I looked at what the bookmakers were giving as the odds for the next uh, Tory. Yeah party leader. Rishi Sunak was the bookie's favourite when I did that video. Michael Gove to me is just so sort of Machiavellian the way he manipulates things behind the scenes but I think he's the only one with a brain. I'm not saying I like him. I don't I don't want him as leader but I think he's, yeah. he's probably the most intelligent of that bunch and I do hope they do choose him because I don't think he's going to go down very well with the electorate to be honest. No, no. Um... He's a very good performer in Parliament, uh, extremely good speaker, I think. But he was mixed up in one of the PPE deals, wasn't he? So I think in any, in any election that would probably come to the fore. I don't know. OK, next question's from Bo Surajadi, who says, I'd like to know his, that's yours, Michael. I'd like to know so, Michael's realistic vision for Britain and how to get there eventually. Can I just start off? I know that question is due. Can I just start off by saying, before we get anywhere, any vision, 
one thing has got to happen. We have to get rid of the current government and then take it yes. from there. But then until that happens, nothing's yep. going to happen. But yes. over to you. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, talk about a vision. I, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. We've got to get rid of the government. I think the only realistic way we'll get rid of the government is if the Labour Party decides, I think we'll maybe cover this later, but uh, if, if the Labour Party decides to go into some sort of... Uh, uh, or make some sort progressive of alliance, progressive alliance, alliance, uh, progressive yeah. alliance, yeah, with the other parties, uh, uh, and then uh, as soon as they get to power, uh, bring in um, proportional representation because the way we're going on now, then this whole system is just just utterly crazy. If and when Scotland get that independence, and it seems to be going that way uh, demographically, then you know no other party in the country's got a hope without the Scottish vote and and the the big contingent coming down from Scotland that are more to the left. The Tories are just going to have a monopoly for the rest of our lives if 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 Scotland secedes. So you heard it here first, boys and girls. Yes. Um, Michael Lambert says, get rid of the current cabal in Westminster, get Progressive Alliance in, and then change our electoral system so that rather than using the archaic first past the post. If you look at a list of all the countries in the world that have um, first past the post, almost all of them are former. British um, members of the British Empire, countries in the British Empire, and um, any, any other countries don't seem to uh, don't seem to have such a, an archaic and stupid system. In my yeah. constituency, I vote every, every every time religiously, and I've been voting here for 20, 30 years. Uh, um, it's an absolute safe Labour seat, and however I vote doesn't make a scrap of difference, and never will. It's, it's just, right. just what's the point? It's, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, just have crazy. No uh, my constituency, uh, by contrast, I voted uh, Lib Dem because they've traditionally always come second in the constituency. It's always been a Tory constituency down here in the southwest. And Labour actually came into second place. So what a wasted vote that is. But really? does it seem right that just making a choice about a tactical vote, you get it wrong, your vote yeah. doesn't count? I mean, surely you should be able to vote for who you want to vote for. And that's that's why I'm exactly. so keen on uh, yeah. proportional representation. Um, I mean, a lot of my viewers have, have pointed out proportional representation can be bad because if you're voting for a party list where the party gets to choose which candidate's going to represent yes. you, then that's not the system we want. But I think some sort of single transferable vote, which they've used in the mayoral elections, um, yeah. that would probably be a good... Um, I think there are other arguments against proportional representation, uh, one of them being that you get weak government and lots and lots of small parties, but mm. I think that's still better than what we've got at the moment. Yes. Where, yeah. where, where 43% of the votes gets you an 80-seat majority. OK, next question from okay. Boxy001. I wonder how angry he, that's Michael Lambert, I wonder how angry Michael is about it all on a scale from one to ten. I put my money on a nine or a nine and a half. It's a great thing to watch that kind of controlled anger. So how angry are you, Michael? I'm sorry to disappoint um, this questioner, but I'm not, not at all angry, really. Um, my emotion, I think, is contempt. I, I have such contempt for this, this government. Mm. I think getting angry about it isn't going to get you anywhere, really. Um, mm. You just have to figure out ways of doing a little bit to try and uh, try and rally some sort of uh, resistance I suppose yeah. but um, no I, I, I'm not angry at all um, I find it all absolutely fascinating um, I think the way the politicians behave and, and, and the way this current government have behaved uh, is quite quite extraordinary but also fascinating and um, yeah. I follow yeah. it with great interest so yes. so um, no, I, I, I'm not, not very angry at all. How about you, Rob? Are you, are you angry? I, I, I get into rant mode sometimes, Michael. As you know, I know you've watched some of my videos. I do get into a bit of a rant sometimes. Um, I, I, do you know, the things that get me angry, though, are, are just being treated with disrespect. And, and you know, for me, I, you know, I think of you, you know, I mean, you, you, as I've told you before, you're one of the reasons I started my channel because I'd, I'd watched a couple of your videos and thought they were amazing. And I thought I'd really like to be doing something similar. Um, but my anger is more at corruption going on and the yep. breaking of the ministerial code and these people just not doing what they're meant to do. Like we have a deputy prime minister who thinks it's OK to go on holiday at the same time as the prime minister, which is the, yep. a fundamental failing of a deputy. And then when he needs to make a call to save lives of Afghanis that have been working with British forces, can't be bothered to, to leave his Uzo in his sunbed to make a call and tries to get the appalling yep. Zach Goldsmith to do it for him and he didn't do it or the guy wouldn't accept his call. That's what gets me angry. I mean, Brexit has really yes. harmed me as it's harmed you financially. And it's also yep. wrecked my my plans for my retirement but I'm not angry about that okay people voted for it but I don't think anybody voted for corruption 
Um, no. And they no. really, that's the one thing that gets me really angry when I look at the £37 billion that have been mm. spaffed on the chest track and trace system uh, whereas being in Afghanistan for 20 years only cost 22 billion only cost 22 billion but that's only yeah. just over half what test track and trace cost us and yeah, most of that money I suspect has ended up in the pockets of Tory donors associates yes. and cronies uh, and that's yeah. what gets me angry and that's what pushes me up to about an eight on that scale of, of one to ten right. but funnily enough not Brexit you know I find Brexit very frustrating that, that people have yeah. voted for it and so many of them and I, you know there are this uh, this group of people that call themselves Remain and Nows but they're not that big to be honest I think there's a lot of people yes. that voted Brexit would still vote Brexit I, you know I'm not confident that if we had the referendum again today enough people have changed their mind yet um I think they're changing their minds. Though. I think that that is going to, going to change. Yes. Um, yeah. It can only go in one direction. I think as as yeah, things yeah. Uh, unravel more and more. So the next one's from John Coleman, who says, "I can't really think of any questions, but I do feel compelled to say that you both are among, to me, the best of your people." I'm guessing he's Irish. I think John. I think he's he often makes comments on the channel. Right. Uh, warmest greetings, best wishes, and much admiration from Ireland to you both. Oh, yes, he is from Ireland. Yeah, that's right. So that's very nice, John. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Thank you very much, John Coleman. That's very, 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 very kind and much very appreciated. Kind. John, all I'd say is I wish that English people and British people, Scottish, Welsh, were as, uh, probably keep it as English people, were more interested in politics in Ireland. I think they'd, uh, they'd be shocked at some of the things that have gone on historically. So thank you for your interest in, in English, mm. British politics. Next question from Anthony Smith. First of all, what a great combo having you both on the same video. Thanks, Anthony. My question to you is, are either of you finding that the confidence of staunch Brexiters is declining with any interactions you have now the damage is becoming more and more evident? Are they less vocal? Now, you really think they are, Michael, don't you? I do. And I... I, I go back to what I was saying before that I, I, I'm getting far fewer uh, comments from um, uh, pro-Brexit people on, 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 on to, to my uh, videos. Uh, you know the uh, "you lost, get over it" uh, uh, type, um, and I sense when I mean it's pretty, pretty obvious to anyone. You even go in the supermarket to see that, that there are adverse consequences of, uh, of Brexit, and, and and how you can go on spouting how good it is uh, without looking really rather stupid. Um, I mean, I think that's that, that's why people are just just are not talking about it so much, and are not um, kind of. I, I would have thought an awful lot of people are, are kind of trying to forget that they actually voted it, or pretending they didn't vote for for Brexit. Um, it's not something you're going to be very proud of right now, looking at looking at what's happened. I'm going to admit to my viewers, Michael, I've never admitted this before, but I, you know, as well as I'm often accused of being middle class, which I'm not. I'm very much a working class boy, but I do. I am white, middle aged, and I play golf for my sins. Um, and as you can imagine, yep. down here in the southwest, I play golf with a lot of very right wing Brexity type people. And I have a very dear friend that I play golf with. He's such a lovely guy, ex policeman. Um, and you know, he said to me a few months back, he said. Um, he saw that how Brexit was impacting my business financially and he just hadn't realised that there was actually a financial uh, dimension to Brexit for me. And, yes. uh, you know, yes. I remember him saying, you know, well, I wasn't that bothered about Brexit. He did vote Brexit. He said, well, I wasn't that strongly about it. And he's, he's sort of, I guess he's backpedaled. I don't know if he's going to watch yes. this. but I think he's backpedaled a bit. I wouldn't say he's a, a rejoiner. He doesn't like the EU. But I think if he'd have known yes. that it was having a financial impact on, on people that he knew, he maybe would have thought twice. So, so to that extent, I'll yes. go along with you. I think maybe there has been a bit of a, a recalibration. I met some people uh, a few months ago, oh, well, beginning this year, we had to dispose of a whole load of stock which we we would have sold in, in Europe, which we couldn't sell anymore. It was a lot of it, many, many lorry loads full of stock. And the people who came along were all clearly people who have voted Brexit. And when they said, why, why, why are you sending all this stuff to the incinerator? You know, tens of thousands of pounds of the stuff. I just said, it's Brexit. And within a matter of 10 minutes, they were all all saying, I had no idea, just just couldn't believe this was, this was a consequence of Brexit. Yes. And when, when you actually see what it means, as opposed to taking back control, which is what people think uh, uh, so many people voted for, is this, this complete and utter nonsense. Um, I think when people actually see what the consequences are, then they, they understand it. So next question is from Robert Reynolds. OK, try this. As close to 50% of voters are not voting in some constituencies in general elections, and Brexit is still to fully impact on the UK population, can you see this voter trend increasing as people become disillusioned? If so, is there an opportunity for a new political party offering devolved power, a written constitution, voter reform and a workable version of UBI, Universal Basic Income? Any thoughts on that, Michael? 
So it's three questions, really. I think on um, more people voting, I, I, I think it's it's around about 67 to 70% vote generally in general elections. Roughly, yes. I'm sure in some constituencies they, they vote less than in others, but I can't really see see uh, that increasing particularly. I, 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 don't suppose, I suppose there was a complete utter catastrophe and there was a, an opposition that was going to take over. I suppose people might come out, but I can't really see that changing. No very much. As far as a, a new party is concerned, again, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, we remember the, the breakaway party with uh, Anna Subri and, uh, and uh, Chakra Umana and so on, and, and, and look what happened oh, to them. They change all, UK. They all disappeared. Yes. Oh. Exactly. I mean, I think, uh, and I'm going right back to the STP, I mean, just to form a, a, a new... Uh, a new political party is so difficult and you need so much money and so much publicity and there's so much against it. I think it'd be really, really difficult. So I, I, I don't... If there's PR, of course, then there'll be hundreds of new parties, but I don't think under our present system there's any way there'll be new parties. No, no I think first past the post really is a, a barrier to entry, isn't it, at any, in any meaningful sense yeah, for a new absolutely. party? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, and as far as uh, UB, UBI is concerned, I, I, I think that's inevitably going to come in one form or another. I don't know how, but I think it, it, yeah. it has to happen, especially with more and more auto automation and people working less, fewer and fewer hours. Yes. I think uh, sooner or later there's, th 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 that will come. Yes, yeah. What do, you, what do you think about that, Rob? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's something uh, I was uh, collaborating with Maximilian Robespierre recently. So UBI is one of his big things as well. And it, it's something that I was very yeah. interested to watch Andrew Yang during the... Uh, the uh, election in the United States for President Andrew Yang was a, a presidential yep. candidate who, whose whole platform was UBI, really. Um, and a lot of the arguments right. against it, which is, you know, cost and things like this, you can actually knock out the water. There are a lot of economic reasons to have UBI. And yes. it would overnight, it could possibly cure poverty in this country, you know. Um, yep. But there's this horrible yes. feeling amongst probably the working class themselves that they don't like shysters, yes. they don't like people that are slackers or lazy or don't want to do a job. Yep. Uh, we sort of value work as though our life is primarily about work. And I think the concept of, of UBI is so alien to a lot of people where we're saying, actually, we're on yes. this planet to live. Uh, you know, we, we work to support ourselves, perhaps, but life is not all about working. Uh, let, let's not yes. value ourselves in, in, in terms of how what, what job we do or how, how important our job is. Yep. So UBI just gives people freedom, really. It gives them a choice because obviously you can go out and work yes. and, and do whatever job you like. There'll be more people getting into the arts. There'll be more creativity. There, there are so many arguments yes. for UBI. I think it must be inevitable eventually because with automation, for example, with... Yeah, within 20 years, all cars and, and lorries are going to be autonomous and so on. And uh, there's... Not, Automation is going to, going, to, going, to, going to get rid of so many jobs that uh, it, it, you know, there are just going to be people with nothing to do and no chance of getting a job. So there has to be some system whereby those people have enough money to go out and spend and keep the economy going. So I mean, it's, it's almost inevitable. Peter Popster says, I love both your channels and I don't really have a question. However, sometimes I wonder how Michael Coates were being called a whiner when I only see true concern. Are you called a whiner, Michael? Uh Sometimes, <laughs> yes, yes. I'm called, I'm called much worse than that, I promise you. <laughs> Some of the comments are quite, 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 uh, quite funny. I had one last week. A guy said, this guy is so depressing. Please don't let him go near Beachy Head. And, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I get people saying you should be, you should be dead. I'm, I'm constantly reminded of my seniority, but, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think if you get worried about that, I mean, it's like being a politician. If you get worried about people making rude comments about you, then I'm give up, do something else. If I get just a thoroughly abusive comment on the comment, I mean, I do try and read through them, although it's getting to the point now where I don't always get to see all the comments. But if I see one that's just come on to just yeah. be insulting, I'll just block it without any further concern. If they've yeah. got something to say, yeah. I'll generally leave it, even if it's not something I agree with. So question from Maverick. How has global Britain's soft power and influence been affected after leaving the EU and standing alone? How much clout does the UK now have without the backing of the EU? That's a numbers game, isn't it, Michael? That's just pure maths, isn't it, really? We have very little clout, uh, uh, apart from being a worldwide laughing stock. We really don't have any 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 power at all uh, i mean as we all know there are four power blocks it's china russia america and and, and the yeah. eu and as part of the eu when we were very influential and we we we, we drove it for, for to, to, to quite a large extent yeah. we were very powerful because if the eu said something everybody takes notice even yeah. china i mean if the eu stands up to china well they're going to take notice if the eu stopped buying goods from china then that would be a serious yes. issue 
and the same with America and same with Russia. But uh, um, on our own, I mean, who cares about a 50, 60 million country? It really doesn't matter. I mean, China just looks at us now, I think, as just uh, ripe pickings. They're going to come over here and they're just going to uh, pick the carcass. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure of it. They just see it as a bargain yeah. basement. And there's nothing we can do about it. And I think Afghanistan, Michael, was a very... Uh pertinent reminder of, of where we stand globally you know America decides to pull out of Afghanistan you know I accept the government had little choice but to follow them I mean we, we, you know we haven't got the resources or the clout to standing on our own on, on the global stage and certainly not in Afghanistan anymore. When you see us sending that aircraft carrier out to the South China Sea and you think just how pathetic yes. is this? You had a little tiny country of 60 million sending out a, 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 a aircraft carrier to, what, to, to threaten China with 1.4 yes. billion It's almost embarrassing um, people isn't it? And an immense yeah. immense Oh, it is yeah. embarrassing. They actually describe that aircraft carrier as a sitting yeah. duck. The next question is from Chris Town, who asks, could it happen and how would the Tories explain away rejoining the single market and customs union? I think it might have to happen. I think they may have no alternative. But how they'd explain mm. it away, I, I, I have no idea. I, um, I really don't know because that actually would really... Um, I mean, the whole point of Brexit was, it, was so that we could... Uh, uh, um, have, make our own uh, regulations regarding products, uh, product standards, and so on, wasn't it? And, and divergence. Yeah. Um, so that would that would that would that would cancel all that. So I don't know how yes. to explain it, but I think eventually it's going to have to because uh, yeah. our economy I, I is going to struggle. Point, this is another one of those questions where I think the answer is the first thing you have to do is get rid of the current government. I, I just can't see this happening. The, the current government wouldn't be able to just go back on all the, uh, the what, exactly where they position themselves on these issues. They have to be moved out. They have to replace, even if it's another Tory government under a yeah. different leader. But the, the current cabal have to go before we can even think about rejoining yeah. the single market and customs union. And of course, it's a relationship with two sides. Would the European Union want us back in their single market yes. and customs union? I'm yes. not at all sure they would. Yep. The way we've behaved, the way we've tried to rip up the uh, the Brexit agreement, the Northern yep. Ireland Protocol, and what have you. And that's all gonna that's all gonna revive um, at the end of this month as well, beginning of October, because our grace period has run out. I'm not sure anything's been done in the meantime. So that's all gonna kick off again on top of everything else uh, next month. Somebody said to me um, a couple of days ago about you know why is it such an issue? We haven't. Um, diverged on food standards uh, with the EU. So why are they being so bureaucratic at the ports about the import and export of food? And my point is this, is because they want a commitment long term that we won't diverge in the future. Exactly. And the current exactly. government are refusing to give that undertaking. Sorry, Chris Town was also asking, is an alternative to staff shortages to allow some refugees to work before a final decision is made on their asylum claim? Any thoughts on that one? I, the, the shortages are so so vast that I don't think even letting asylum seekers to to to, um, uh, to work would make much difference to the shortages. But I think in terms of, uh, I think it might make sense um, because it gives them something to do. If they're going to be allowed to stay here, at least it gives them some work experience and some experience of uh, of meeting other people and so on, as, as opposed to sitting around in detention centres. And yeah. I think in a way it would be a good idea. Yes, I mean why not? I don't think it's going to benefit the economy much, but uh, socially, I think it'd be a great idea. Just imagine those uh, 8,000 odd uh, people just coming across the channel in the dinghies. Uh, if we trained up every one of those as a lorry driver, it'd be 14 years before we could even fill the uh, <laughs> shortfall. So next question is from okay. Loki's children. One, how will the Tory party get Johnson out of number 10? How long will the Tories take Johnson's incompetence for? Do you think my, uh, Boris Johnson's under any immediate threat? Not immediate, but I think I, I think he will do. I, I think in October he may well be. Yes, because of all the things we've talked about before, they're going to happen from the beginning of October, and yeah. uh, I think as soon as Tory uh, uh, MPs start seeing or going back to the constituencies and finding that people are grumbling, particularly about yeah. prices and shortages and so on, uh, and they're going to start thinking, "Hello, this is going to affect our chance of getting re-elected next time." Then there'll yeah. still there'll be some rumblings, and then then sooner or later they'll be putting their letters into the. 1922 committee and and, and, uh, and and I don't think I mean I don't think Johnson is at all popular I think he's very unpopular I don't think he's got many friends I don't think even MPs like him but he's no. a vote winner but yes. I think as soon as they see he's a vote loser they'll, they'll, they'll stick the knives in, the, in his back yeah, I, I don't think that, he's going to last that long that's precisely how I see it with Boris Johnson I, I get the impression Michael he's not at all popular amongst Tory MPs but they, no. they put up with him even though his policies and his, his beliefs and things are different to theirs but as long as he's winning votes for them they'll keep him but the yep. moment his popularity goes way below Starmer's um, 
then, yep. then he'll be out. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I like your optimism. If you think that could start happening in October, that's that's fantastic. I'll take that. Well, <laughs> fingers crossed. Loki's children also asked number two, with the Tories controlling the media, how long can the Tories hide the complete disaster of Brexit? I guess he's talking about, you know, the fact that the shortages in the shops, they tried to originally blame it on the pandemic and to a certain extent global COVID worldwide stuff. But then people are just giving comparisons with continental countries or even Northern Ireland, which is still within the sort of customs union to all intents and purposes, and there are no shortages there. So it's clearly to do with Brexit, however much the media is pushing the idea that the pandemic or the pandemic is to blame. Well, he says ha, 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 um, with the Tories controlling the media, the t Tories don't control the media. The media support the Tories. They might well turn against Johnson. I don't think they'll turn against the Tory party, but I think they might well turn against Johnson. Somebody has to be blamed for all these catastrophes that, have, that are taking place and have taken place. Yeah. And he's going to be a pretty big target, I think. So yeah. they, 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 once the press start turning against him, uh, that'll that'll be the end of him anyway. The media aren't sort of beholden to the Tory party, are they? I mean, they no. they, they supported no. Blair. I mean, the Sun and the uh, various other yep. what we consider right wing ranks uh, supported Blair. Yes. So they're not wedded to the Tory party. They're only. Um, uh, supporting them for as long as it's in their interest to do so. And they? of course they want a story, don't they? And if the story is uh, how badly Johnson's doing, then, then then that's what they'll go with. We're giving Loki's children a bit of a good crap of the whip now because there's a third part okay. of this question. How much will the disaster of the Afghanistan uh, evacuation hurt Johnson as he's had 18 months of doing nothing to plan or execute a withdrawal? Well, it's fair comment that, uh, that, that, you know, that uh, it's um, outrageous that we waited to the last minute and waited till till Biden, uh, without even consulting us, decided to go ahead with the um, end of August uh, withdrawal. But I mean, that's only one of one of so many things, and I think it'll probably be probably be forgotten quite quickly. It's not going to be uh, the, the issue is going to be shortages in food and uh, the economy and uh, jobs and all the rest of it uh, and prices going up that, that's that's what's gonna that's what's gonna affect him i'm not holding up to too close a scrutiny about not standing up to the usa or, or getting any concessions yeah. from joe biden i mean i think that was a pretty big ask however much boris yes. johnson blustered about how he was going to do that you know, I don't think yeah. it's, it's hurting too badly. And uh, no. the special relationship between the USA and UK, I, I think to a large extent that special relationship is something fabricated in the UK. I don't know what your feeling is. Yes. Um, I think it's a lot more special here than ever was in, in America. Yeah. And there's a classic, classic image, uh, Rob. I, you, you'll have seen it, that one at, at the G7 with Johnson hunched over and, and Biden with his arm on his shoulder, as if to say, listen, my boy, you know, you've got to put your socks up. It just showed instantly in one image, we're not important to America. Question from Ethan Christopher Hartley. How do you both stay so calm in the face of all the predictions of Project Fear coming true and the tsunami of lies, deceit and cover-ups of the last three Tory administrations. I, mean, I hate saying we told you so, but we did, didn't we? Mm. Like everybody else, I mean, we, we, we are, um, to use that whole book expression, we are where we are, and it's just a question of responding to it, isn't it? And uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's terribly difficult to remain reasonably calm. Um, uh, as just an observer of the the nightmare. Well, I like to think of myself as fairly stoic, and you know, that's that phrase, "This too shall pass." Hopefully, in ten years, we'll look at back at this and think, "Oh my God, we really reached the lowest of the low at that point back in yep. 2021." Surely things can only get better. To borrow a phrase, they could get worse before they get better. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Carlo Gagliardi makes a good point, actually, Michael. Your followers and Michael Lambert's yep. followers are smart remainers. Therefore, while analysing endlessly the stupidity of Brexit gives considerable intellectual solace, it doesn't help in practice. So my question is this. What is today a meaningful political representation for rejoiners? Well, as we said before, I think the only answer, really, the only future, it is if, if, if the Labour Party does uh, enter into a progressive alliance. Um, because if that doesn't happen, we are, as, as, as the question says, we are stuck with, 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 with um, the present government forever. As far as rejoining is concerned, uh, um, I, I don't think there's any policy we can pursue because in the first place, as Rob said earlier, are the EU going to want us back? I, I very much doubt it. I, I'm not for a very long time, I wouldn't have thought. I think we're out for a long time. Mm. So I think it's really a question of hoping that at some stage, before too long, we can join the uh, the, 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 the customs union and the single market again, yes. which would solve instantly solve so many problems. But of course, it would mean we'd have to conform to uh, to EU standards for our, our our products. I just cannot see another referendum at this point, and and as you say, it could turn out to be pointless anyway because the EU, you know, the terms that we'd be offered to go back in, we've lost a lot of the the additional benefits. We were a special case within the EU. We had lots of different dispensations given to us that we've lost forever. 
And at this point, I'm sorry to be defeatist, but I'd, I'd, I'd be more than happy just to be able to rejoin the customs union single market. And if we can get freedom of movement back, that would be amazing. <laughs> I, I don't think we're ever going to see uh, ourselves as a full member of the EU again in my lifetime, partly because, like you say, Michael, I don't think the EU will have us back. Anders Bertelsen, as a non-Briton, the most enigmatic thing is opinion and media. Is it possible to suppress vital facts to the public? Have there been any demonstrations against Priti Patel's anti-democratic lawmaking? Suppressing facts, I think that happens all the time. Um, I think the government has control of what uh, what, 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 what uh, gets out. And uh, I mean, that's why we have uh, uh, whistleblowers who are going to may be made, um, whistleblowing is going to be made a criminal offence very soon. Yeah. Um, but but, but that, that, that's, that is because people do suppress facts that the public should know about. It's this bill that is just going through, which is going to make uh, um, uh, demonstrating... Uh, illegal practically yes uh, and so many other things i mean it's 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 it's, it's terrifying it's terrifying it's what uh, totalitarian states do and and very very worrying yeah um this, this is the bill that's making it illegal in terms of if a protest causes inconvenience to bystanders or uh, creates a noise uh you can be subjected that's to, right. to up to 10 years in prison uh for taking part yeah yep. Um, and also on that, I mean, um, the question of there mentions Priti Patel, but of course, it's the, in terms of suppressing vital facts from uh, to to stop it um, getting getting out to the public. Michael Gove is the mastermind behind that. The Freedom of Information Act has been um, subverted at every turn by Michael Gove. It's his role in the government, yes. basically, to to to. to face up against freedom of information requests there it's come out there's been a blacklist where any questions from certain journalists is is automatically discarded and, and being told that it's not in the public interest to release that information yeah and it's basically michael goes full-time job that's what he does is subverting this yeah. uh, openness of information and look at the trouble the good law project are having in getting the names uh, of these um pbe co um, contractors I mean, that should be available to everybody. Uh, the, the other part of this question, though, is quite interesting about why there haven't been any or have there been any demonstrations. There haven't. And this is something I don't understand. I don't understand there isn't more anger. I don't understand why people... Yeah, OK, so most people are not interested in politics, but usually young people are students. Why are students not out in their millions demonstrating whilst they still can, drawing attention to, to everyone about about how serious this is, how this this this... this government is is creating an authoritarian state they want to control everything and i mean once we've lost this right to demonstrate this this basic civil right which we've had for hundreds of years and and which exists in most countries yeah uh, i mean how do you then how do you then show your 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 um, yeah disapproval of the government if you can't if you can't walk down the street with a banner there's the legislation against protests there's the legislation whereby it's been suggested that the royal national lifeboat institution could be prosecuted for rescuing uh refugees uh, drowning in the channel um and then you've got these this idea that anybody handling leaked documents could also be subjected to up to 14 years in prison basically going after the german it's very similar to what they do in poland or hungary or, or belarus so you see this yes. whole raft of legislation that seems to be anti-democratic, yeah. and, and that's the phrase that this question is using, anti-democratic lawmaking, that's exactly what it is, but it's not just yeah. Priti Patel, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson there as well. And it's all being rushed through, you know, so that uh, so that all, all this is, is, is enacted or receives royal assent before before the, the, the trouble kicks off next month, uh, and, and uh, you know, people won't be able to go out and demonstrate uh, unless they're very brave or... or, or uh, prepared to go to prison. So question from Nate Wonderman. Considering how shambolic Brexit has been executed by the Tories, how much of a cluster you know what would Scotland leaving the UK be, especially in terms of shared assets, particularly military installations and North Sea oil? Do you any thoughts on Scotland? Michael, have you got any connections with uh, Scotland? I, I, I don't, Rob, no. Um, I, I would imagine any um, a separation would be extremely complicated and, and, and Sharing out the spoils and also all the things I don't know that all depend upon who owned the uh, the drilling rights and so on. I, so I, I I really don't know. Um, I think it would be a very very good thing for Scotland and and I wish them all the well, but um, all the best. But uh, 
for us it would be a disaster because it would give the Tories so much a bigger advantage yeah, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and make them so much more difficult to beat. I, I, do, I do think that the Brexit um, vote is, is giving you know this idea that the referendum that we've already had was a once in a generation opportunity for them to vote for independence. I do yeah. think Brexit has changed the rules of the game. If I was Scottish, and I yes. do have a Scottish grandfather, actually, yeah. and I've worked in Scotland a lot in the malting industry years really? ago as well. So I, you know, I, I have got feelings about this. I, I, you know, if Scotland votes for independence, I'd be the first, as you say, to wish them all the best. And uh, I'm sure one yeah. of the first things they'll do is look to re-enter the European Union. And I think if yes. Scottish independence yes. does happen in the next few years, which I think is highly likely, then I think for all those mm. unionists that would like uh, Scotland to stay part of the UK, I think that's just yet one more thing you're going to be able to blame on Brexit, because it's Brexit that has really yes. uh, sparked that whole debate off again, really. And then, of course, if they were to leave and rejoin the the the, 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 uh, the EU, what happens with the border? Are you going to be able to ca- carry goods from Carlisle to Edinburgh? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a- MR Spoon says, first of all, thank Michael for his excellent videos. Does he see himself starting a business again? Yes, I'm pretty old, but I, I, I need to start a business. I lost my other business to, to the EU or to Brexit. Um, I'd love to start a new business, but I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, but I am, I am looking for something to do, yes, definitely. Merck van der Moylen, it, it's reported that EU's Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, is in the race for the French presidency next year. Could be fun, but what are your expectations? I, I think he's been pretty good as their negotiator. Um, you know, when you when you, when you hear um, politicians being interviewed, they'll answer any question. They'll answer it certainly, and they'll, they'll answer it uh, decisively, and uh, never waver. Uh, they never say I don't know, but um, I'm not a politician, so I can say I, I really don't know. I don't know enough about it. I, it Barnier seems to me a pretty straight guy. Um, but I have no idea about French politics. I really don't. He, he seemed to be the adult in the room during a lot of the Brexit negotiations. Yes. So yes. Uh, certainly if I was a yeah. French voter, yeah. as I said, I think Michel Bernier is more sort of on the right. I'm not sure he's sort of very far right, but uh, he's definitely a sort of establishment yeah. figure and, and slightly to the right of that. But yeah, I think he'd be a very competent guy.